What's going on guys? In preparation for this video, I analyzed 50 games from the same player, rated 1128, and I wrote down the top five mistakes that he kept making. And in this video, I'm gonna show you what they are and give you some tips on how to get past those. This player actually reached out to me and asked me if he could hire me to analyze his games and kind of create this type of uh, analysis for him. And usually I say no when people ask me about coaching, especially recently I've been trying to focus on creating content for my channel. But he said I could post this video. He was okay with me using the analysis as a learning experience for other players. So if you're interested in something like that, and I've told you in the past that I don't do coaching, this is something that I would make an exception for. You can reach out to me on chess.com, just direct message me. My info is in the description below if that's something that you're interested in. But now let's jump in and take a look at these five mistakes that this player kept making. All right, so here's my spreadsheet with all the games. You can see I analyzed 50 different games and recorded all the different mistakes. All right, and if we scroll over, we can see all the different mistakes. And before I get into these top five mistakes, I wanna talk about this one over here. So no big mistakes. So in 24% of the games, he didn't have any big mistakes. And this is kind of interesting because I wanna show you something else. I'm gonna pull up, this is his chart of his rating. If you look back in December, he was around 900 and you can see he's got a pretty nice uptrend all the way to 11.28 with very few big dips down. And part of the reason for that when I was going through his games is he was pretty consistent and he had, like I said here, 24% of his games, no really big mistakes. And so this just goes back to the importance of avoiding blunders and, and just not making mistakes can really help you improve and become more consistent. One other thing that I'll say is most of these games were in the 30 minute to an hour time range. And I know a lot of people play faster games than that, but when you're learning, playing longer time controls is very helpful because you just have more time to really focus on what you're doing, what you're trying to learn, as opposed to not running out of time. If you've seen some of my games, even in my climbing the rating ladder series, if I play with too low of a time control, I don't have enough time to think through what I'm trying to do. I end up just kind of scrambling at the end. So if you're able to play longer time controls, that's one thing that's very helpful and he's doing a good job of that. All right, now let's talk about the mistakes. Tactics mistakes was at the top of the list, 24% of the games. This is to be expected. Tactics are the most common thing in chess. There's tactics pretty much throughout the whole game. And so let me show you some examples of the mistakes that he was making. All right, so in this position, Jake was white. He played queen to b3, nice move, setting up some pressure on b7 pawn. And black played e6. And now Jake just missed a, a little tactical trick where he could have just really won the game outright. If he captures this pawn, he's threatening the queen with the pawn, and he's also threatening very big threat on b7 and there's really no way black can defend both of those things and, and it's just a crushing move so he played d6 instead which kind of has the right idea he's trying to attack this pawn but it's not as good as capturing here because he doesn't also have the major threat of attacking the queen and so that's just one example of a tactics mistake you know you can get better at these by doing more and more puzzles and over time your brain will kind of pick up on some of these patterns and you'll see more of these all right, so here's another example of a tactics mistake. Uh, Jake played c5, and then white played knight c3. And at this point, uh, Jake decided to play a6. He could have simply captured this pawn, and I think maybe the reason he didn't was because the queen could recapture, but if that happens, then he could have played bishop c5, pinning the queen. And so capturing is not an option. Most likely, um, he would have probably had to just trade queens, and that's just a free pawn, and black is really great position. So, and not that there's anything necessarily super bad about that, but he just kind of missed this little tactics trick with the pin on the queen. And so just an example of how doing those tactics puzzles over and over to really train your brain to pick up on those patterns is the best thing that you, you can do to help with these kind of mistakes. All right, and next on the list, we have blunders, 12%. Um, this is part of chess. You can't really avoid these 100%, but 12% is, is not too bad. And I like the fact that he had more games without big mistakes than he had games with big mistakes. And I think everybody knows what blunders are, but just a real quick example from the game. So Jake was white, and after his opponent played a knight here, I think he was kind of thinking about the pin, and then he couldn't take the knight because of the rook. Got a little caught up in that and played e4, and just forgot that the bishop was just hanging and lost the bishop. So that's a blunder. You gotta avoid those as you continue to improve, but they happen from time to time. Just the best thing is to just do a blunder check, scan for undefended pieces and that kind of thing, and, and uh, over time try to eliminate those blunders as much as possible. All right, the next mistake that I put down is what I'm calling incorrect trading. So a lot of people think in chess that pieces have point values, a knight is three, a bishop is three, a rook is five, 
and if you just trade and the points are equal then it must just be a fine trade but it turns out that there are a lot of cases in chess where trading even if it's equal point wise doesn't make sense in the actual game so let me show you some examples of of some trades that jake made that didn't really benefit him okay so here's a game jake was white he had a very good position he's already ahead a piece and his opponent made another mistake blundered the knight here and so he's very far ahead he's clearly winning but then his opponent castles and he makes the move queen to b4 offering a queen trade now first of all this is not a bad idea okay when you're ahead material so he has three pieces against just one it does make sense to trade queens and so if that's what he was thinking i totally understand that but in this position if you take a look at black's king he doesn't have a c pawn to defend him from threats here um, white has a lot of pieces ready to attack the king and if you're going to have a strong attack usually you don't want to trade queens because queens are very good at checkmating your opponent's king so if you trade off the queens it's a lot harder to get checkmate now in this case because he's ahead three pieces it's not really a big deal he's probably going to win the game anyway and he did went on to win this game but generally speaking i would like to see maybe a move like rook a to b1 which by the way the queen is trapped um, but building up the pressure keeping the queens on the board even like bishop takes a7 is a really good move setting up something like queen c7 and black's going to have a very hard time not getting checkmated in the next couple of moves like i said he went on to win the game but try not to trade queens if you have a strong attack on the king and you see white's king is totally fine there, there's no pressure here from black and so leaving the queens on is, is very good for white in this case all right here's another example of incorrect trading so jake was black and his opponent played b3 and he played this move bishop h3 which it's kind of a clever idea right he's giving up the bishop so that after this pawn moves he can bring his knight in and get a fork on the king and the rook so i understand where he was coming from but the issue here is that if white captures that he's getting the bishop after you go there he's going to play king f1 and if you take this he's going to get two pieces and you only got a rook so so you got five points, you gave up six, so you lost a point, but in practice, those two pieces are usually much better than a rook, and even if you can get a rook and a pawn, it's still better to keep the two pieces. So even if it's two knights, and you're trading those two knights for a rook, I wouldn't do it. If it's two bishops, or if it's a knight and a bishop, and you're trading it for a rook, usually that's not a good habit to get into, and over time, that's gonna really hurt you if you continue to make those trades. So those are some examples of how making trades that really aren't you're not really losing much material, but they really don't benefit you as the game progresses. So just something to keep in mind. All right, next on the list, we have blocking bishops from development. So let me show you some examples of the games where this happened. All right, so in this game, Jake was white. He played d4, and after just a couple moves, we get to this position. And he had the option to trade this bishop for this knight, which I really like this move. If he would have played this, black has to recapture. There's a big weakness here on black's king. All, all white has to do is move the knight, pawn up, and the queen's going to come to h5 and black, black has some big problems so that's one thing that i like about trading the bishop but what was played in the game was e3 and what i don't like about this move is that this bishop is now blocked right if you're going to develop this bishop what are you going to what are your options going to be well you could go to d2 it's not really a great diagonal for the bishop you could play b3 and bishop b2 but i think better would be like something like bishop f4 bishop g5 or like i said i would have preferred to capture the knight but the idea is Pushing a pawn forward to block your bishop really should be a last resort. Sometimes you have to do it because you're trying to defend something or there's just no other moves. You, you Maybe you need to get this bishop out and castle as soon as possible. But if it's not a, you know, a last resort type of situation, I really don't want to see bishops getting blocked like that. You want to complete your development, which means all pieces on the back rank need to get out. And so you want to try not to block them with pawns. All right, and then the last mistake we have on the list is giving up an open file. And it only happened in 8% of Jake's games, but this is a very good thing for a lot of players to pay attention to. So let's look at some examples. All right, so in this game, Jake was white, and we have this A4 move that was played. And at this point in the game, we have the first open file. So as a reminder, an open file means a file with no pawns on it. And right now, Jake has control of this open file. If black were to try to bring his rook over or his queen over, he couldn't do it. He would just get captured by the queen. So he's got control. He has the ability at, at any point to move here and start attacking these pawns. Very good thing to have, right? But if you look at what happened in the game, he ended up going back here. Some other stuff happened. And then now black has control of this open file. And a lot of times what you'll find in chess is that whoever has the open file usually can keep control of it. And a lot of times once you give up the open file, you can't get it back like this is a good example now there's no way that he can ever play his queen here because the rook is just controlling everything and so black has all the 
all the options. If he wants to come here and attack the bishop, if he wants to come here and put him in check, if this uh, second rank opens up eventually, he can go there. He's got all the control because he's got the open file. So very important, if you have control of the open file, to unless it, there's a, a reason you have to move your queen, you want to keep that open file. So that's one example. Let's look at one more. All right, so here's another game. Jake was white. He got into a very nice position, traded off these knights, and at this point in the game, he is ahead by a pawn. He has six pawns. His opponent only has five. And again, we have a game where there's only one open file. It's over here. And so white's priority in this position should be to gain control of the open file, right? So a move like king d2 or king e2 and then rook to h1 would be fantastic. But instead of doing that, look what white does. And at first glance, it's like, oh, it's not really a big deal. He just traded off the bishops and then he plays that. But that little bit of delay, and now look who gets control of the open file. And there's no way that white can regain this. And you can, once you lose it a lot of times, like I said, you can't gain control of that open file. And now white has to deal with a move like this, attacking his pawn, here, attacking these, here, getting on the second ring. There's so many threats that black has that white has to deal with now because he didn't gain control of the open file. If we go back just a couple moves, instead of playing this check move, maybe king here, let's say black does something like this. Now, white has control. White has you know, the, the idea of coming here and attacking this. And more importantly, black can't go there and create all these threats because white has control of the open file. So all that to say, open files and controlling them are very important. Whenever an open file opens up, you wanna start thinking about, can you get a rook there before your opponent? And if you can, that's usually a very good thing. If you really wanna take this concept to the next level, you start preparing ahead of time before the files are even open and putting your rooks where you think a file might be open eventually. And then after the pawns get traded off, you have your rook set up already on the file. But that's just another thing to keep in mind. All right, guys, those are the top five mistakes. I hope you learned something from that. If you'd be interested in me doing something similar for your games, uh, like I said, chess.com, direct message me and we can talk. But as always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.